I guess we got the green light. So we're going to uh, move with this talk. Like last time we did, <coughs> let's make it as informal as possible. And you ask me questions, because this is a little bit technical. So if I'm going too fast, you can stop it. Um, if there are things you don't understand, make sure that I can explain to you before we move forward. <coughs> First of all, my title, I don't know if it makes any sense to anybody, but what I put in is uh, when you hear hoofbeats, think of horses, not zebras. And I thought misdiagnosed manifestations of hormone imbalance in humans and consequences. So what I said um, last time when we were here, I said around here in Texas, when we hear hoof beats, we don't think of zebras anyway, right? <laughs> we think of horses, <laughs> because we don't have them here. But in other parts of the world, when you hear hoof beats, you may think of zebras. But unfortunately, here, we do think of zebras a lot of times, even though they're not here. Right. So we're going to know why I put this title as we go through the talk. Next. Well, uh, maybe I should say a little bit about myself. Um, I'm a board certified allergist. Um, came to Tyler about two years ago, worked with uh, UT Health Center, um, and then I joined uh, Ms. Christie in uh, her practice, so we working together. We do our separate things, but together in, <laughs> in, in many ways. Um, and so many of the things that I'm going to talk about I was doing this before at UT, before I joined Ms. Christie, but some of the things that she's going to talk about and that will come through the talk came because of her. <laughs> she introduced me to Bias Life, and that has made a big difference in a lot of the things that we do. And that's why we're here today, because otherwise maybe you know, this will come, but way later. Mm -hmm. right. So. Um, if you have come to me about a year and a few months ago, uh, probably we wouldn't have this talk either because I was trained strict uh, traditional allergist and I had no idea about hormones. Um, I had ideas because when we were in medical school, we did learn about that, but the way we were taught about hormones is more theoretical. It was not applied to anything. And it was so esoteric that it was difficult to understand. That chapter, I really didn't understand it very well in medical school, <laughs> honestly. But um, I went to a meeting in Dallas in uh, March 2007. And during that meeting, um, a number of family physicians and uh, ENT physicians get together every year to try to learn the art of allergy how to learn allergy testing and practice allergy in their office in five days. So during that uh, meeting, they also have sessions on hormones. And um, I attended the sessions on hormones because I didn't know what they were doing. And I found that very fascinating because that was the first time in my whole training that I've seen that facet of it. I didn't have any uh, idea uh, how we can use the hormones to treat diseases and the links that there is between hormones and other things that uh, general practitioners and all physicians treat. And now, after the meeting, I went on and tried to learn more about it. I bought tons of books about hormones. I went back to my biochemistry books to try to learn a little bit more about those hormones and see how they relate to each other. And so I came with uh, one diagram, and they, we will talk about the diagram. So for today, I hope after we finish this uh, presentation, you will be able to uh, identify the main hormones in human health, understand the different pathways through which hormones affect the body, and test for hormone deficiency and link hormone deficiency to various diseases treated by all physicians and treat various conditions with bioidentical hormones and bioslice slim. Right. 
So this is the beginning. After I read all the books, and um, I'm still improving on this, I came up with this, this diagram to try to explain everything that was happening. So most of my show, or my talk, will be on one slide, <laughs> almost one slide. And so I will make a lot of comments on this slide. And uh, this beginning slide is just introduction. How many of you know that our good hormones come from bad cholesterol? <laughs> Probably. This is uh, uh, something that I, I found. I said, wow. I mean, I knew it, but it was like, why didn't I think about that before? Good hormones come from bad cholesterol. So the LDL cholesterol gives us an intermediate hormone called pregnenolone. This pregnenolone divides into two other hormones, progesterone and DHEA. The DHEA and progesterone together come down and give us female hormones, estradiol and estron. Estriol is the third estrogen that is produced during pregnancy. So this is a mild estrogen that is very um, benign. It doesn't cause a lot of problems for women or anybody. But the other two are not so kind, and we see why. So the two hormones, progesterone and DHEA, also produce testosterone, which is a male hormone. But both women and men make that testosterone. If we don't have it, we're not going to function very well. Uh, next slide. So when we get older, we tend to lose progesterone. And I'm going to talk from the woman's point of view. When is progesterone made? Progesterone for women is made during the menstrual cycle. So if a, a woman is not menstruating, the production of progesterone is very, very minimal. It's not much at all. So next slide. Normally, when a woman has a cycle of 28 days, from 1 to 28 days, the 14th day is known as the ovulation. That's when the egg comes out of the ovary. And before ovulation, the estrogens that I show you go up, they get to their peak, and then start coming down. Right after ovulation, the pocket where the egg came from becomes a hormone-producing pocket. It's called the corpus luteum, yellow body. And that corpus luteum produces progesterone. The progesterone starts going up. You see that it was flat. And then right after this uh, middle here, it starts going up just to speak about seven days before the menstrual period and then start coming down. In this area, when the progesterone declines, many women find themselves in trouble, which means that's when the PMS comes in. <laughs> so the premenstrual syndrome, it is a syndrome because it's a number of symptoms that come together. Uh, many feel bloated. Uh, many women uh, feel unhappy, uh, emotionally labile. Some of them cry. Some of them laugh. They don't know why they snap. I mean, it's a <laughs> lot of stuff. <clears throat> so. But there are other things, serious things that happen too. Premenstrual headaches. There are many women who have migraine headaches. So they get this premenstrual migraine headaches that occur during this time period when the progesterone is down. And asthma is also another one. Many women or young girls get premenstrual asthma. So they get an asthma exacerbation during that time period when the progesterone is down. Um, they have a lot of cravings. Many women crave for sugar-containing stuff. And so they want to eat chocolate during that time period. <laughs> and there are some other conditions, such as dermatitis or hives. There are some women who get premenstrual hives or menstrual hives. So during the menstrual period, they get their hives. Or before the menstrual period, they get their hives. When they've crossed that threshold, that's it. Then the hives go away. So all these are due to the fact that the progesterone went down. So progesterone is very important. Well, as we get older, that progesterone uh, goes down for most women because there are many cycles that are without ovulation. 
So in the late 30s or mid 30s and beyond, there are many of the menstrual cycles that are without ovulation. So as I said before, if you're not ovulating, your production of progesterone is going to be very small. So as a result, they're not producing progesterone. And not producing progesterone has a lot of consequences. And some of the consequences are what we're going to talk about. So go down. And this is the master slide. <laughs> the uh, one and only. I wouldn't say one and only. We have several others, but I didn't go down last time to show you all the things that are underneath that I talk about. Everything that I'm explaining, I put in words also on different slides, but I'd rather talk to you, explain to you on this one slide. So let's say that both men and women produce these hormones. Men produce more testosterone than progesterone, so women produce more progesterone than men. Uh, as we age, we lose the progesterone, and I'll show you why. When the progesterone goes down, the cortisol, which is our natural steroids that we produce, also goes down sometimes, or most of the time. When it does, there are consequences. You get inflammation. So we have inflammatory processes that go on and immune uh, problems that also go on. Inflammation, people get aches and pains. So you have arthritis, uh, some muscle pain. People don't realize that. They don't know why they have all these pains. You wake up in the morning tired. You have no idea why you have these pains because the cortisol is down. People, um, we think in allergy that Children are the ones who start with allergy. So around age two, many children have allergies beginning when they're exposed. It takes about two seasons for our immune system to learn about what is in the environment. So around age two, then many children acquire their allergies. So they have a runny nose, they have, they're going to have the asthma, they start having the asthma, and uh, uh, eczema starts earlier, but it goes up. And as time goes by, some of them outgrow their allergies and others continue having it until adulthood. But now I realize that there are many adults who come to me and say, my asthma or my allergies did not begin until I was older. So I wondered why, why this late onset? Well, some of the explanation may be due to the fact that the progesterone went down leading to a low cortisol and that cortisol lacking causes inflammation, so people have their asthma. The other thing that I will add to this, the premenstrual asthma that I mentioned before, if you take hospital discharges for asthma, between the ages of uh, one to about 15 years of age, you have young boys who are more hospitalized for asthma exacerbations. Right after age 15, it's the young girls <laughs> who are hospitalized. So you wondered why right after age 15, we have more young girls hospitalized for asthma than young boys. And I think the only thing that makes the difference is the hormones. So I would say that progesterone is the major one that is at, at play here. When the progesterone goes down, the thyroid also doesn't work so well. So the thyroid uh, function goes down. When your thyroid is not working, you tend to put on weight. And so you will go to the doctor and say, you know, the past uh, year I have put on 20 pounds. I don't know where it's coming from. All of a sudden I start gaining weight. I don't even eat much, and I'm gaining weight. Well, the doctor will say, let's check your thyroid. And one thing that they will do, they check the thyroid stimulating hormone, which is a signal to the brain that we should make more thyroid. So if we check that, the result may come back normal. And if the result is normal, we say, okay, go home, go exercise, do whatever, eat sensibly, you know, maybe you're eating too much junk, and that's why you're having all these problems. <laughs> So eat sensibly and you know, exercise and come back see us in six months. <laughs> well, as I said, if your progesterone is down and your thyroid function is not there, no matter how much exercise you go through, you're going to still keep your weight. The weight is not going to come off. 
The other factor that we didn't take into account when we measured TSH is that the end product for the thyroid gland is T4 and T3. I didn't mark it, I didn't mention it here, I didn't write it here. T4 is the pro-hormone, so it converts to T3 to be utilized for metabolism. So the T3 is what the active hormone is. So T4 has to convert to that T3. But occasionally, that conversion does not occur. And if it doesn't occur, you still have plenty of T4 and you have low T3. So if your T3 is low, you're not metabolizing well. So you eat, the food will sit there, and it will turn into fat. So you're, not gonna, you're going to gain weight. So that's what is happening here. So uh, I think that in order to capture that aspect of it, if you want to measure the thyroid uh, function, you need to measure not only the TSH, but you need to measure the T4 and the T3. Find out what they're doing. And when I do that in clinic, several patients come and their T3 is low, even though they have normal TSH and they have normal T4. So for those, I try to help them with thyroid hormone to, so that they can lose the weight or help them with their metabolism. Because when your thyroid is not working, you get very tired. You don't feel so well uh, because your energy level goes down. When your progesterone goes down, the worst thing that happens actually is the insulin. Insulin is the number one fat maker in the body. And it's the bad hormone. I really think that I don't, it is good because it, will, it helps us initially to put sugar in the cells so that we can have energy and all. But in the end, it's a bad player. Because when your insulin goes up, initially, your blood glucose tend to go down because you have too much insulin around, you have little glucose, so your blood sugar goes down. And around noon time, you feel very shaky. You feel like you, if you don't eat, you're going to pass out. You're not going to do well. Uh, that happens sometimes to a lot of us. <laughs> and then you want to go eat. When you eat, um, in the afternoons, you feel very tired. You feel like you can't think anymore. You have to sleep, take a nap. Well, your body doesn't like that, so the body causes you to say, hey, you better go eat something. Mm -hmm. So you start going to gobble up on uh, carbohydrates. Mm -hmm. So you start eating sugar-containing things. So it's a subconscious programmation or program that teaches you, go eat something sweet so that you can get your sugar back. And when you do, the insulin being a trickster, it's like the jokester or in uh, Batman. <laughs> so this uh, insulin takes the glucose and put it right into cells, including fat cells. So the fat cells are busy with that, insulin, that glucose to make fat. They produce the fat up to one point, though, because the fat cells, they have a mind of their own. At one point, these fat cells decide that this is too much work for us. We really don't want to do this anymore. Mr. Insulin, please take your business elsewhere. And the way they do it, they produce hormones. So the fat cells are going to produce leptin. They produce adiponectin. They produce visfastin and apelin and many other hormones. These are supposed to go to the brain and signal to the brain that they have enough of this. Well, after a while, well, the brain uh, gets it initially, but after a while, the leptin is there, the, all these hormones are there. The brain says, well, you know, I'm, not, I'm really too tired of doing this work for you too. So the brain doesn't register anymore after a while. So the fat cells go haywire. They start growing, you know, um, disproportionately. So no matter what people do, they cannot lose that weight. Uh, because many of the people will come and tell you, I don't even eat much. I drink water and gain weight. So what is it coming from? So it's diet is not going to do it. All right, so let's think about this. When people gain weight, when they see doctors or they see other people, they say, go exercise and lose the weight. When you start exercising, do you know how much it takes to lose one pound? You have to lose 3,500 calories. And that 3,500 calories, the way you lose it, you can walk on a treadmill four miles an hour 
for seven and a half hours. <laughs> you know, imagine how many people can do that. No wonder why many people who have basements and uh, stuff, they buy treadmills. Mm -hmm. They keep them in the basement, but it's like a phobia, a fear to go to the basement and exercise. <laughs> they don't want to go there <laughs> because it takes a long time to lose one pound. Then we turn to exercise, uh, to uh, diet. Let's diet now. The minute you start saying, I'm going to diet, the body say, uh-huh, I'm going to die soon. I'm going to starve soon. Mm -hmm. So then I need to hang on tight on the fat because the fat is what I'm going to use later on when I'm really about to die and I'm going to use that as energy. Mm -hmm. So the body is not going to relinquish the fat. What you lose initially is going to be water and muscle. And when you do that, after a while, you hit your plateau, and uh, you say, well, this is not working anymore. This diet is not working. I'm killing myself for nothing. So you go back to eat, right? When you start eating, guess what the body says? Man, I was going to die. Now I have food. <laughs> so I better store more fat. <laughs> so then you start storing a lot more fat. And when you do, well, you know, you, you gain more weight. So this is the yo-yo diet, right? You go up. You diet again, you go down, and then you go further up, <laughs> and then you go down. So that's what happens. Well, when the uh, fat cells don't want the glucose, guess what this glucose is going to go? It goes into the bloodstream, so it stays high in the blood. When we measure it, it's very high, and we say you have diabetes. You know? So because the glucose has to go somewhere. Well, diabetes then is equivalent to what we call insulin resistance because the cells are resisting the insulin putting glucose in them. They don't want it anymore. Right. So these fat cells also produce many, many other things. One thing that I didn't say is that uh, at this point, uh, leptin, leptin is very important because it was discovered in 1994. And people had high hopes that this leptin is going to solve obesity problem in the world. Why? Because when they injected in obese mice, these mice lost weight. So we thought that, wow, if we can find a way to inject this leptin in humans, then they're going to lose weight for good. Well, how many years now? <laughs> um, people are still doing research on this actively, I tell you. Immunologists are doing it. Uh, endocrinologists are doing it. I mean, if you go to a chiropractor, in their offices, they're still talking about leptin. So everybody's talking about leptin everywhere. But for now, I really don't know any injections of leptin that would take weight away. So about, what, two and a half months ago or so, I went to the granary here, you know, the granary on the loop. Mm -hmm. And um, I asked them, do you guys have leptin yet? They said, leptin, what is that? Are you from Mars or something? <laughs> so, um, they said, no, it may be coming, but that's for the future. So I said, OK, great. Well, I went home. And about two weeks later, Miss Christie calls me up. Dr. Tano, there's a product out there, <laughs> a product that is making people lose weight. But because Christie knows about this, I had presented this in uh, her office one time to people who want to lose weight. And I did hormones and helped them try to help people with their hormones. And so she knew about my goals and called me, maybe I may be interested in this product. So I went there, she showed me, and that day I think uh, uh, Godwin made um, some of that product. He put in that uh, uh, measuring cup and uh, put water in it, shook it up, and then gave it to me. I drank it up, tasted like orange juice, really nothing extraordinary. <laughs> I say, yeah, I didn't like the taste. I said, uh, I don't like the taste, right? <laughs> So I, uh, Christy gave me all the information, the tapes, I mean the uh, uh, CDs, and I took it home with me. Honestly, I put it on my desk. I never touched it because I said to myself, this is a gimmick, right? Remember, every year somebody comes with a weight loss product. Mm -hmm. There was the Cortis Slim and all these other things, and you know they, they fall off the bandwagon. Mm -hmm. So after a while, I really think that I don't want to put myself in this. You know, I want to make sure that it works before I did that. But my mistake then 
was that I didn't ask her what contained, I mean, what is the ingredients or what does it do really? So I didn't read up on it. So a week later, she calls me up again and say, Dr. Tano, I tell you, this product is doing good for many patients, so you better put yourself in it. I went to her house again. This time, I was uh, talking to her and she said, you know, I have been reading about this product, really. It contains a lot of fiber and stuff. And um, one of the things that they say is that it contains a leptin booster. And this is a, a paper where it's saying that. I said, what did you say? <laughs> she said, a leptin booster. But you guys know that I had gone, about two weeks prior, I had gone to the granary to try to find leptin. Mm -hmm. So when she said that, I was like a little kid. Mm -hmm. I said, Eureka, we found it. <laughs> this is it. <laughs> so I was jumping up and down and said, yeah, OK. I mean, I'm honest, was I was really <laughs> <laughs> I was very happy about this. So um, at that point, I said, OK, I'm going to try it on some patients. So I took the product, and uh, I gave it to some of my patients. And they come back and say, wow, this is a great product. I'm losing six pounds in three weeks. I lost 17 pounds. Some lady comes, I lost 17 pounds. I, might, I want to get it now. I don't want to to let it go. I want to have it because I don't want to run out. So it was that exciting. We have some other people coming up and jumping up and down in the clinic saying, wow, we have, I have never seen anything like that. I mean, Miss Christie is my uh, witness. <laughs> it's really true. But you know, we can't say names. Mm -hmm. But there are many, many patients who are very satisfied with the product. That gives me even more courage to go and talk about it because of what it does. All right, so I'm going to, uh, because we're going to talk more about Bios Life. The product is called Bios Life Slim, by the way. Those of you who have not gotten the name, it's Bios Life Slim. And we'll talk more about it. Ms. Christie is going to talk about that as well. So the fat cells, when they're doing all these other things, <coughs> in addition to what they do, they do also this. They produce something called adipokines. These are substances that are uh, TNF-alpha, IL-6 resistant, and all these other ones that I have enumerated. They're bad for you. They cause inflammation as well. That's why many people who have obesity problems have aches and pains, joint pain, muscle pain. They don't know why, because the fat cells are pouring out. These substances that cause inflammation in them. The fat cells come down here, and go along with uh, the skin cells and the adrenal glands. The adrenal glands are these uh, bean-shaped kind of glands on top of the kidneys. If you have ever seen a, a drawing of a kidney, they always put a little uh, bean-shaped kind of thing on top of it. So they produce a lot, a lot of our hormones. So the adipocytes of the, the uh, fat cells and skin cells and adrenal glands come here and produce more estrogens that produce estradiol and estron. When these two are produced, they cause more trouble because they help um, facilitate the production of uh, insulin. So insulin goes further up. When insulin goes further up, guess what is happening? You're coming back here, and you're having more trouble. The thyroid function goes down. When your thyroid function goes down, uh, when your, your uh, estradiol and estrogen go up, the thyroid function goes down because there is a protein that carries the thyroid hormone around. It's called the thyroid binding globulin. And that thyroid binding globulin goes up as your estrogens go up. And when it does, it carries, this is a huge protein now, carrying this small amount of thyroid hormone around, not available for metabolism. As a result, people continue putting on weight. So there's, there are many sites or many mechanisms that perpetuate the fat-making machine or the fat-making process. And that's why people don't lose weight, no matter what they try. The estrogens, I said to you earlier that these two are not so kind. Why? Because the estradiol and estrone cause six different cancers in women. 
too much of it is not good. And the cancer that they cause, they cause breast cancer, they cause uterine cancer, ovarian cancer, vaginal cancer, cervical cancer, and even colon cancer. In men, we're thinking now that possibly prostate cancer may be from the estrogens. And why I explain. Because when men and women get older, they lose or we all lose the testosterone. And where does it go? Most of the time, the testosterone converts into female hormones. So you have seen, if you look around, you have seen um, a lot of men who have breasts, what we call men boobs. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> you know. Mm. So those, <laughs> those men boobs are due to the fact that the men are producing more female hormone. Some of them have a shape, you know, the hips like men, like women. And that's because they're producing more female hormones. They're, and at that point, at that point, libido, forget it, right? Sex drive is not there. No. When we all lose our testosterone, sex drive is not there. And that's why a lot of couples don't do so well. <laughs> well we know that. <clears throat> so when your testosterone converts to uh, estrogens, as I said, pro probably prostate cancer may be due to the estrogen because embryologically the prostate comes from the same origin as the uterus. So if you can have uterine cancer because of the estrogens, you may think that you will have prostate cancer because of the estrogens as well. The other thing that we have to remember is that younger men, who has more testosterone than younger <coughs> men? The 15-year-old, the 20-year-old, the 30-year-old, they have tons of testosterone. Why don't they get prostate cancer? Because they have a the, the testosterone. Well, it's only when we are in the 50s, 60s, and beyond, when we convert our testosterone to the estrogen, that this cancer surfaces. So that's why I really think it's the estrogen causing the problem, not the testosterone. Now we move gears and uh, go towards DHEA. This one is dehydroepiandrosterone. And that hormone, is, uh, it has a long name, and that's why they give you a shorter version. <laughs> a shorter version, DHEA. It's the mother of all the hormones. The more you have of it, the longer, apparently, you live on average compared to people who have less of it. Unfortunately, though, age is the enemy. When we get older, we lose our, test, our DHEA. And when we get stressed, we lose our DHEA. So if you look at some younger people, they have gray hair sooner because they have this loss of the DHEA. So it's called the longevity hormone. And uh, that's one loophole that the government